Sorry. Uh, Steindorfer, and we're going to hear about space debris and the challenges uh, uh, there in that topic. Yeah, welcome everybody. So it seems like I'm having sort of the first and the last talk today. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about space debris laser ranging challenges and yeah, some, some future, future aspects today. Um, yeah, first I've tried to put a summary slide. Um, yeah, basic topic uh, of this talk, I will try to somehow connect the two Let's, let's say worlds of space debris laser ranging and satellite laser ranging. So actually we are using the same techniques, we are using the same lasers and everything. So actually both techniques or key technology, technology issues from both worlds will affect, affect both, both sides of the uh, yeah, communities. So one, one big part about that is probably picosecond, uh, picosecond based megahertz laser ranging. So we are currently in Graz, uh, we are actively, actively doing research in that respect, trying to implement um, megahertz laser ranging into, uh, yeah, into routine operation. So I call it somehow provocative, one laser to rule them all. So yeah, maybe in the future is this possible without any switching times to switch between um, yeah, high precision um, geodetic applications and space debris laser ranging. So yeah, maybe it is possible to, for example, switch um, in LEO gaps to some dedicated space debris targets. Um, another thing I was also previously talking about today, backup uh, corner cube retroreflectors on existing um, satellite missions. So why not put retroreflectors on, on, yeah, on future missions to, yeah, to actually yeah, assist attitude determination, for example. Um, a second big thing about space debris laser ranging is in general to increase the network. We need more stations able to, yeah, able to track space debris. One or just a very few number of stations will not be able to improve orbit predictions. Um, second thing, bi-static. Um, yeah, there, there was, it was proven a couple of times that bi-static or multi-static measurements are possible. So why not approach for a space debris laser ranging, for example, the astronomical community, they could join in with a couple of large telescopes just trying to receive, receive photons from space debris laser ranging experiments. Um, improving the prediction uh, quality for, for some priority targets. So space debris laser ranging on TLE level is, yeah, is, it is limited by prediction quality. So yeah, we have to correct time biases and also not, not time biases are the only issue. We also have to think about range biases, which is actually traveling quite a lot when, when tracking space debris. Um, yeah, also with that respect, B and multi-static uh, space debris laser ranging is also affecting the prediction quality. So a couple of stations doing, doing multi-static measurements could improve the predictions in a way that yeah, that it is comparable to, to single station doing, doing uh, space debris laser ranging. Um, attitude determination, one big part for the future is data fusion. So we have to combine multiple sensors, multiple techniques with each other. It is not only satellite laser ranging, it is space debris laser ranging, it is radar, radar cross section, for example, light curves, single photon light curves, or pointing determination, optical pointing determination, plate solving techniques. So fusing all these technologies together would help, yeah, getting a better, better understanding of space debris targets. Um, yeah, also for support for future removal missions. So yeah, we actually need to know the tumbling behavior of space debris objects before we are even having a chance to, to, yeah, to be able to remove these targets uh, from orbit accordingly. Um, next topic is improving output and, and observation times. Um, as you knew, there were, uh, were some, some efforts uh, guiding towards uh, daylight, ops, daylight space debris laser ranging observations. So yeah, there is still some, some improvement to do, um, probably also connected to, to making targets easier visible during the daylight and yeah, or higher power lasers or noise, detect, det uh, noise, noise reduction, for example, from the detector side. And last but not least, um, daytime uh, aut automation issues, also pointing towards day daytime detection of targets. So this is also connected to the SLR community, um, tracking targets, keeping, keeping, uh, keeping, being aware of time biases, 
centering the targets in the field of view, reducing uh, the time allocated needed for, for actually getting returns to, to individual targets. Um, so much about the summary uh, of the targets uh, of, the, of the presentation. I will just give a few details on, on, on recent progress with that respect. So megahertz laser ranging. So we are, as, as said before, working on, on working on implementing a megahertz laser ranging uh, at Graz SLR station. There will be a dedicated talk to that on Thursday from Wang from our station. So here are the stats of the of the megahertz laser. So we are 10 picoseconds, 100 kilohertz to 1 megahertz in the order of 20 to 40 watts. Um, yeah, microjoules. You can you can calculate accordingly. And this leads us to up to 250,000 returns per second. So this is, this is actually then also connected to a couple of things uh, with respect to data analysis. So you have to think of different strategies when, when analyzing such huge amount of data. Datas. I, I, actually, I don't want to think about the RGSI pass for analyzing the whole RGSI pass in the software. Um, yeah return rates up to 100 times more for LEO satellites and uh, in the order of 10 times more uh, for GNSS. Um, yeah, as said before, future, as a future perspective, um, we probably need only one laser for, for yeah, geodetic applications, megahertz-based, and in theory, there is no, nothing stopping us from doing megahertz, megahertz-based space debris laser ranging uh, with such lasers. Big advantage, no switching times. We could use the same setup, the same laser, the same detector for, for both um, measurement types. Um, yeah, high, re high resolution satellite signature. So in, set in terms of satellite signature, there was, a, was a, so somehow an, an increase when, when going to kilohertz-based uh, kilohertz systems. So yeah, what are we expecting when thinking about megahertz satellite signatures? So we were able to we were able to to gather a pass as an example from Archisai. You can see below here. So even with the current setup, which is not perfectly tuned so far, we are able to see satellite signature effects. But again, pointing to the presentation of Wang on Thursday, with that respect. Um, yeah, another topic I already talked about that backup retroreflectors on yeah on, on side surfaces of existing satellite missions. I, I will not spend that much time repeating what I said uh, what I said this morning about that. So residual simulations of, of retroreflectors, yeah, could actually help to design future satellite missions. Um, okay, if it's changing, yes, extending observation times. Um, it is important to improve the predictions for, for that respect. If we want to, at some point in the future, be able to do a blind tracking of space debris objects, we would need more reliable, reliable predictions with that respect. Um, of course, a larger station network of, uh, of space debris capable stations would help uh, to realize that. And yeah, final goal, blind tracking or daylight tracking of space debris objects, not being limited to yeah, visible targets anymore. Um, yeah, correcting inaccurate predictions. This is also somehow connected to, to automate, uh, automation issues. So yeah, we need software tools. We are using software tools to actually determine the time bias in real time, and then we can we can yeah we can apply the time bias to the tracking software, and yeah reduce the amount of time to find uh, to actually get returns to the target. Um, this could be automated in the future, also connected to the satellite laser ranging community. Um, noise reduction and daylight detection, yeah, point again, again to detector technology, what, what Ivan uh, already mentioned before, and yeah making, yeah, making use of different wavelengths, infrared, increasing detector size would also be a topic, so yeah, 40 microns might be somehow a critical, <laughs> a critical sensor size with that respect uh, in the future, so there is a need for larger sized, larger sized um, yeah, spots with that, yeah, according to that. Um, making targets visible during daylight. Um, actually, what you're seeing below here is uh, some, some, let's say, office-based test where I found, I found a usage of a FFP2 mask 
uh, in, on top of a, on top of a just a small small camera. So basically, by moving moving the camera, uh, the FFP2 mask on top of the camera, I was able to create shy, uh, small small dots on the on the on the camera image, which actually really helped me to program a, a software detecting satellite uh, similar images. So yeah, actually that's what you're seeing what you're seeing below here. Yeah, and finally, automation, um, target tracking algorithms. I was basically already talking about that. Um, yes, and last but not least, attitude determination. Um, you, you're also connected to um, data fusion uh, techniques. In the lower left graph, you see um, actually in red a light curve, light curve, single photon light curve recorded, overlaid by, by uh, space debris laser ranging residuals. You actually see in the space debris laser ranging residuals the, the span of uh, plus minus, oh no, actually 13 meters in the residuals, and the target is rotating. It is some, some upper stage rocket body. The target is rotating where you see this oscillating behavior. And at the same time, there is, there is a single photon light curve recorded. So this is, I mean, we are gathering a lot of, a lot of photons in different uh, wavelengths at our, at our um, yeah, detector system, so at our telescope system. Why not use them to, to um, generate uh, light curves simultaneously to, to satellite laser ranging or space, space debris laser ranging, for example. And, and this is also some nice, nice graph. So this is a space debris laser ranging uh, path of, of Envisat. And what happened in there is uh, the first you see the returns of the retroreflectors, and then some point the retroreflectors were pointing or uh, were, were moving out of the field of view due to, re due to the rotation of uh, Envisat. The connection, uh, the the the, um, the satellite laser ranging or the, the retroreflector returns were getting off, and then were immediately replaced by the by the residuals from the space debris laser ranging target from the whole body itself. So this is just a transition within one pass which was able, which was possible to be measured. Um, yeah, pointing me to the end. Thanks. Thank you, Michal. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question on what they've just seen? No, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.